Podcast City Network. Thank you for tuning in on this episode of the Everly Show. But before we get on with the guest onto the program today, there's a couple things I do want to mention that you can help out with supporting the Everly Show. If you're looking to start a podcast and already have a podcast and you're looking for an affordable podcasting hosting site, Podbeam is your number one choice. Podbeam offers statistics with in-depth analytics to manage your podcast needs. Use the promo code podbeam.com slash PB sign up and get a free month off. That's podbeam.com slash PB sign up to get a free month off and see why 1,500 episodes have been shared all over the world in the past 11 years with over 3,000 subscribers that have chose Podbeam as their number one hosting site. And if you're looking to get into advertising, Podbeam advertising. You'll get a hundred dollars off advertising when you sign up as a sponsorship over on podbeam.com slash pro slash PB sign up. That's podbeam.com slash pro slash PB sign up. You're listening to the Everest Lee Show. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of the Everett Lee Show. I'm the Everett Lee. Hope everyone's enjoying their weekend, their week, whatever your flavor is. I certainly am. As I sit here, I got the laptop. I'm on my laptop. I haven't fired up my laptop in a very long time. I meant to change a picture on this laptop. And the computer had me refresh my whole thing and it moved windows moved everything around on this computer so it's taken me just a bit to actually take everything and put it back the way it was all i wanted to do was just change the windows login profile picture on here that's all i wanted to do i don't know what the hell happened it took me a bit to figure out but i finally did so I'm sitting here in my room with TV on at this recording right now. House is quiet. My daughter's asleep. My wife's at work. And just me, microphone, headphones, and this laptop. And another interview taken from a recent episode of ELS Uncut with myself and Ripper Blackheart. Wayne Smith. He is a independent comic book publisher and artist and a really big fan of music. The same kind of music I'm into, metal and rock. Just a great guy, great conversation. We, we talk about comics, we talk about music, we go all over the place in this conversation that you're going to hear here in a moment. Really enjoyed this. I had it sitting on my computer and I was going to release it and then realize I got mixed up with a lot of things going on, doing commentary for Knockout Wrestling. Shout out to Knockout Wrestling and the whole staff of Knockout Wrestling. Doing commentary at Chris Carnage, getting caught up in stuff like that, getting caught up in stuff, podcasting network, and a lot of other projects and a lot of these other projects are closing in as the year is about to close out. I can't believe this year is almost over. I'm glad. 2020, it sucked. (laughs) 2020 sucked. I just did not like this year. Did not like a lot of things that happened and went on. And I am glad 2021 is right around the corner. Hit the reset button. Let's start things fresh. Let's get over this fucking COVID-19 shit. Let's get back to our lives. Because I've adjusted to it as much as I can. But I'm still, still trying to get along with the changes and everything. And it's been a freaking headache. But enough of me ranting. I want you to hear this interview here with Wayne Smith, taken from a recent episode of ELS Uncut. I'll see y'all after a bit here. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, 
on the podcast right now, comic book writer and publisher Wayne Smith is on the program. So, Ripper and I were talking, and he basically said he everything he learned from comics he ripped you off on. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think we were a major in- inspiration to those guys. They made it quite obvious at the Pittsburgh show. Yeah, as I said, you can ask him about the first time we met. It was like, literally, the, we worked we worked Mid Ohio Comic Con, and yep. back then it was in November. And then uh, when was Pittsburgh? Was that March or April? Yeah, April, it was wasn't it March? Yeah, yeah, I think it was after. It was it was April, and. He, we're set up and like diagonally across from us is uh, Wayne with his Illusion Studios and Frank. What was Frank's at the time? What was um, New Breed Comics. New Breed Comics, and I was like, yep. and I was like, hey, those are the guys. <laughs> like, he stands right up and starts pointing at us. <laughs> it's you, we're all here because of you. <laughs> the funniest thing about it was that. We were all bummed out when that happened. We were just like, man, this is this show's going nowhere, and we were all tired from the drive up there and everything. We were working all other jobs, and then we were just ready to call it. You know, we're done for the day, and then Corey pops up out of the blue and says that. So <laughs> it was awesome. So he does mark out on things. <laughs> yeah, he does. Wow, I I love this. I love this. So. How now? How how do you know? So that was that your first encounter there, or um, how how well, did you find out or know about Wayne beforehand, Ripper? So, like I said, I used to go to the Mid Ohio Comic Con all the time. Okay, and they were there, and I bought their stuff. And what they did is they had some full size comics, a few, but yep. they had a lot of these what we call ash cans, which they're about the size of a Reader's Digest. Right. right? Yep. And what they did. I didn't. I didn't get as fancy as them when with theirs, but they had uh, <laughs> uh, Reader's Digest. The inside was black and white. It was pretty much just copied a little bit better than yep. copier paper, but it was pretty much like hard, heavy stock copy paper. But what they did is uh, they took like colored paper for the cover, and then they had this. What what was that? Like the clear it's acetate, acetate, acetate clear. Then, then put the artwork on top of that. So then, when that goes on there, you got the color background, oh. and then oh but, yeah. But I was just looking. I'm like, this couldn't cost too much. The the clear part, the clear acetate, mm-hmm. that was probably the most expensive part of this. Yeah, was, and if I don't go that route, I could probably pull this off. So I get with my my one buddy Bob Balbrick, and I show him. This is like a year, a year or two later. We, I, I met Bob like a couple of years, shortly after that, and we started, you know, we're both big comic book fans. Matter of fact, we found out that before our local comic book store went out of business, the woman who owned it offered to sell it to both of us at one time, and had we known each other at the time, I'd have a goddamn comic book store right now. <laughs> But that, that's every creator's dream to have their own comic book store. Yeah, I mean, she she offered yeah. to sell it to me and my brother, and you know, we, we, there was no way we was gonna be able to do it by ourselves. And then, same thing with Bob. So I get with Bob, he's, and then he's like, "Well, uh, I'm not good at drawing." I was like, "No, I'm not either." So I find an artist. His name was Steve Williams, and it was just by chance that I found him. Uh, I was in a store looking at something with like one of them o- online auction stores. One, it didn't stick around very long, but he worked there. Yeah. And uh, I was someone. I don't know how we got on got on a subject with the store owner about comics. And I said I'm looking to try to do my own. She's like, Oh, you need to meet this guy, Steve. Come here. So we sit down and start talking, and then you know we I show I so we have a meeting. I'm like, This is what I want to do. And it was Illusion Studios. I had all of them. I had Jonathan Baker. <laughs> I had Project Enforcer. I had uh, Blue, Blue Star. Star. I, as a fact, Blue Star. Blue Star. One of the people that worked on Blue Star is the father of one of my buddies in wrestling, who was also a manager. Uh, wow. Really, Vinny Lam- Vinny Lamford. He does Vinny from Jersey, uh-huh. and his dad. Uh, 
did some artwork or something on it, I, and I, I have it somewhere. But after you told me, I went and found it, and it's on. I can't remember his dad's name, but his last name's Lamford, and it's it's in there. I was like, well, son of a bitch, small <laughs> But yeah, well, I, I had all I had all the Illusion Studio stuff. I had uh, all of Frank's major mogul, uh, all that stuff. So. Yeah, we had the little meeting. I said, "This is what we want. This is what I want to do." All right, I wrote the stories. Steve uh, drew it, and then some. Of, we all attempted to ink it. None of us could ink. <laughs> That's the at hardest all. thing in independent comics: getting a good inker. At all, <laughs> but you know, we're just trying. To, we're just trying to get something out there. We're, we're trying to save money, right? And uh, so, and then Bob would take it all and put it on the computer and lay it out. And then uh, put in, like, the word balloons, the thought balloons, type in all the words and whatnot. He was also, he'd also work as our editor. And then we'd put him, we'd put this out. And like I said, first place we worked was mid-Ohio in Columbus. And then we went to Pittsburgh. And that became, I don't know, a good two or three years we did this. Yeah. Until me and Bob got involved with the wrestling. But, yeah, first day at Pittsburgh, I look across, there's Wayne, there's Barbie, there's Frank, and I'm like, these are the guys. That shit I showed you. <laughs> <laughs> he was really excited. <laughs> now, 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 Wayne. Now, Ripper comes up and he's all excited, pointing at you guys. What? What was your guys' reaction? Like, how? What? I think we were shocked at first. Well, I remember. <laughs> we were shocked because, like I said, we were feeling down at the time. But after he left the table, I'm like. We're all like, yeah, we're great. <laughs> we got to keep going. We got to keep doing this. And, well, I remember you came up to somebody and said, see, I told you somebody knew us. Or something like that. <laughs> well, we had started doing those panel discussions in Pittsburgh. They were the first con to let us do it. And we'd go in and show people how we were making the books and how to do it affordably. Right. That was our goal. And the funny so, yeah. thing is that Wayne comes over to our booth. And usually when somebody comes over and they look at your comic, the first thing they ask is, who's the artist? Yeah. But Wayne doesn't because <laughs> Wayne, he's a writer. First thing I'm he, a writer, yeah. Who's the writer? <laughs> <laughs> artists, art, artists get all the love at uh, Comic Cons. The writers hardly get any. Yeah. So yeah. anytime I was in Artist Alley, I always tried to go around, meet the other people there, meet the artists, meet the writers. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. It seems like it seems like artists they get the most attention there, and the writers are like second there to what's 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 going on there. Now, getting into the comics, what uh, when when you're growing up, Wayne, what what inspired you? What comics did you get into growing up? Uh, mainly superheroes at first. Uh -huh. I was Spider Man, Batman, you know, the Hulk, all that stuff. I wasn't too crazy about Superman, but uh, other than that, I liked everything. Uh, the first comic book I ever read was at my my dad's friend's house, and I was really young, and it was a Thor book, and it was Jack Kirby's artwork Ooh. that grabbed me right away. Yeah. And it'll call the man the king for nothing. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. I, I think I told Ripper this. I have issue 432 of Thor, where Thor kills Loki and gets banished. I have that. Oh, issue. yeah? Yeah. I have that issue put away somewhere. But there, there for a while, I, when I was living with my parents, I was buying. There was a time where growing up as a kid, up until about my late teens or early teens, I, did, I got out of comics, and then when I got into my 20s, I picked it up again. I was living with my parents, and then when I moved out of my dad's house, I was on my own. I'm like, I can't I can't buy comics like I used to. I actually got to support myself. Oh, no, dude. Like, I got a sensory overload walking in a comic book store now because there is so much stuff out there. And, you know, me and Wayne's in the same generation when you know our day was you had a couple spinner racks at the local grocery store yeah. drugstore and Ew. that was it that's what you had to choose from they, there wasn't a whole lot of these specialty shops you kids now they you're spoiled well uh, i i remember i remember going up to win dixie win dixie and they had they had the spinner rack and 
you always have to look at the spinner rack right up front before you're leaving, before you're going to check out, because every once in a while, you find something that's there that you don't find at your comic store. And I found a couple of great comics. I think I found an issue of Wolverine that I didn't know was out there. I said, wow, I didn't even know this was out. And then there was a... Another issue of like Spider Man, something I found at the at the local at the local grocery store. I think I found most of my Spider Mans I had put up at um, at Kroger's. I found <laughs> because at the time in Tennessee there was no place to buy comics. You know, yeah, no comic book stores. No, we had where I was at. We had Maury's newsstand, and he had a little wall of comic books. So anytime my parents didn't, uh, they wanted to get me to do something I didn't want to do. They just go bribe me with some comic books. You know, they were 25 cents back then. Yeah. Four for a buck, you know. <laughs> Give me four comic books. I'm happy. You want my hair cut short? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> wow. Now, growing up um, collecting comics, getting the comics, what did you mostly collect, or did you just collect everything? I did superheroes at first. I mean, you got Spider-Man and Batman. Those two characters alone had about four, three to four different titles. So you can collect all of those. Um, but you, you said something about how you got out of comics. Yeah. I did the same thing. As we got in, I discovered music, and I'm a heavy metal nut, so I just started collecting music. And uh, I did that till the 90s. And then grunge hit, and then I was like, I'm going back to comic books. I'm out till this is over. So uh, <laughs> when I started Illusion Studios, I would only been back into collecting again for a few years. Okay. Yeah, I... <laughs> Right, right around the nineties. There, I, I was a kid in the eighties, teenager in the nineties. So I remember when the grunge thing hit, and I, I thought that was like something neat. So I mean, I was in high school when, like, you know, that was that. I, I, I when I was a teenager, I loved that music though. But when that finally played its course and died, and it wasn't big like it was, I didn't realize all these metal and uh, hard rock eighty bands was still doing their thing and i oh, yeah. kind of went back to that there and i was like oh man this is great and so i became a fan of both because i have you know memories of both both you know types of genres and music there and as i got older over the years it's like i my my perspective in music people can't believe like when i talk about stuff they're like you like that i'm like yeah man it's like i was talking about the other day i was talking to a to a to someone at work about uh, we're talking about the fifties and sixties. I'm like, yeah, Roy Orbister, um, and just just like the Temptations and all this stuff. And they're like, how do you know about that? I'm like, I read about it, <laughs> and I listened to some of the music. I pulled it up, you know, some great hits there. But then, like like heavy metal. I like my senior year in high school. It's like from when I was a freshman in high school, it was alternative grunge. And by senior year, I met a guy named Todd. Todd's like, hey, man, you're listening to Slayer? You're listening to Pantera? I'm like, no. He's like, he gave me a gave me a cassette. He's like, Slayer. Opened it up, looking at it, popped it in my Walkman. First song, Angel of Death. And I'm like, oh, God, I love it. <laughs> and, uh, and then Pantera, he let me borrow uh, uh, Far Beyond Driven and um, Great Southern Treadkill. And I just got into the heavy stuff there. But I always go back to the alternative stuff. But I, I love the heavy metal. I mean, um, this, I was this, looking at... This is a guy, you want some new... Uh, music, some heavy metal that you probably never heard of. Uh, oh go, yeah, Wayne. Wayne. Yeah, our store has a lot of that. We sell a lot of that. He pulls eighties kind of rock vibe, thrash, all that stuff. Oh yeah, and it's incredible the stuff he puts up. Like, cause I'm I, I follow is he's got a store, uh, a, a, a record store in in his local mall, uh, yep. last minute standing. And I follow it. So when he he's putting up oh, new music, blah blah blah, I'm like, where the hell is he finding this shit, dude? It's like <laughs> new release sheets <laughs> every week. Go through the new release sheets. This band, hey, they look metal. Let's look them up on YouTube, and that's how I find them. Damn, 
I, I love I love the band. I I have a serious XM. Liquid Metal Octane has made me discover a lot of gr- uh, great bands. I love the band Power Trip. Oh yeah, I've had a lot of people come in for that. Yeah, they got a couple albums out. Yeah, Lo- love love Power Trip. I I love I love Slipknot. I love Slipknot. I've always liked Slipknot since the uh, late, early 2000s there. I always loved Slipknot. If there's one person I can ever interview, it's Corey freaking Taylor, man. That's who one of my bucket list interviews is. Corey Taylor. I just love to sit down and pick his brain for a couple hours. That's one of my like like bucket list interviews, if I can ever do that one day. Talk to Corey Taylor. Um, talking about like new music. Metallica, Metallica fan? Somewhat, yes. Somewhat. <laughs> Not everything, right? You like the you like the <laughs> early <laughs> stuff. Early stuff is awesome. Yeah, ride the lightning. Garbage, though, right? What was that? Garbage, though, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's garbage. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, you know what's funny about Saint Saint Anger? If if you you have it, it came with a DVD. And I was working for Decode Magazine that's up in Michigan, and I was doing reviews. So I got this. I bought it used, so I didn't pay a lot of money for it, so I could do the review. And I listened to the CD, and it's pretty bad. It's it's just recorded horribly. But if you watch the DVD, they're playing the songs, and it sounds so much better. Yeah, it, it I does. I don't understand yeah, why, does. but it does. It sounded a lot better on DVD than it did on the CD. Yeah, at least on the DVD, you don't hear the snare drum, right? <laughs> yeah. There is. It's just snare drum, snare drum, snare drum. Like, yes. why are they emphasizing a snare drum? <laughs> hey, you want to see something yeah, well. funny? Fear, um, Dream Theater. I I love Dream Theater, yeah. man. They they put out a video a while of a few years ago. I guess auditioning for new drummer, and so Lars came yep. in and playing it. Did you know which video I'm talking about? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ripper, did you see that one? I did. <laughs> yeah, Lars is playing the play. Yeah, Wayne's laughing. He knows he's seen this. This is great. <laughs> so Lars is auditioning for the drum for Dream Theater, and why he's drumming in the video? They they put in they edited it to where every time he hit the snare, it just sounds like the snare from <laughs> Saint Anger. <laughs> sounds like a tin can. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably lose, I would probably lose my shit watching that video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. It was so funny. <laughs> and they're like, what was it? They're like, nah, too much snare, man. Next. <laughs> it, it, was just, it was just great. But Lars, Lars is probably thinking, that's okay, you can't afford me anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember my senior year, Ride the Lightning. I wore that I wore that CD out in shop class. My shop teacher, he was pretty cool. He's like he's like you guys can listen to CDs. And so one day no one had anything and they're like, Denver. Yeah, CD. I'm like, yeah. It's like Metallica. They're like, yeah. Which one? I'm like, Ride the Lightning. They're like, yeah. So we're in there cutting wood, you know. Um, and then the uh, the stoners are over there making, you know, wooden bongs, head banging to, <laughs> for whom the bell tolls, you know, cutting some fingers here and there. But it was all good. <laughs> it was all good. But I want to get into just a little bit, Wayne. Tell them about yeah. Legacy, because that was very. No, I was just. That was I was looking that up beforehand because I'm like, I better blown up on some of the stuff I've done. I'm, I'm pretty old now, so I forget a lot of that. But the old legacy website is still up. Not every other pages work. But, yeah, I was going over it looking at all the different companies. I mean, we had like 35 different companies. But what Legacy Entertainment, a creator's co-op was, um, we noticed as we were putting out the comic books and doing the conventions year after year, we started noticing a lot of our independent friends that we met were gone. And when I contacted them, when we get back home, I'd ask, hey, we, we missed you at the con this year. And they'd be like, yeah, well, I overspent and I don't have any money. And I don't. Everybody was going under. They were spending so much money producing their books. So that's why in Pittsburgh, we hit them up and said, let us do a panel discussion and show these people how to do the books inexpensively. To do great quality books, but do it cheap so you can keep putting out another book as you build your fan base. And that's oh. what the goal with Lego was. 
to help those people keep coming back and, and to give them. We worked out a deal with Preeny in Canada, the, the comic book printer that does um, Cerebus, and he gave a discount if we sent two books a time to get them printed. So that helped people quite a bit. Oh, wow. And that, that was the whole goal, to, just, uh, to make sure that we keep going. Did a lot of times too, like say uh, Wayne. Wayne's going to go to a convention, but I I wasn't. Hey, you got some. Right. Books. I'll take some. We had a rack. We had a magazine rack where we would take the books for the legacy members and sell them at the shows that they couldn't make it to. Oh, nice. That's that's amazing. I like that. I like that. I like that. Helping helping out to uh, helping out publishers. Yeah, I, it the, was a co-op, and I don't think. Yep. I've never seen anything in comics like that before a couple of people had talked about it before but nobody was pulling it off yeah so i basically got a burr up my ass and said look i'm tired of losing all these friends i want to help people they can do it they just have to watch you know the p's and q's watch your how much you're spending and where you're going and just you know do it good but do it affordably and that was my whole goal was like (laughs) (laughs) we did that for a little while (laughs) now the first the first couple war shows that i was a part of wayne and uh frank and barbie frank and barbie filmed filmed some of so that was the new studio dragonfire studios after uh, illusion studios was gone and legacy was ran its course we just formed a new studio uh, uh, Someday, somehow, I'll get the I'll get the illusion stuff back. You watch. I got it. Right. <laughs> we we keep saying we're gonna do it, but we're working on this crossover right now, and we got to get this thing done first. Because yeah, now they're yeah. you got it's made mainly like a kaiju. Type yep, a Godzilla King Kong type universe. It's called a kaiju verse. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Japanese word is de kaiju means giant monster, so we just use it kaiju for short. So they've been doing a lot of that. Although I want them to do the other stuff because me and Wayne did work together once on a project. Uh, One of my favorites. We we Marvel was going to restart the Epic line. Yeah. The Epic imprint. Yeah. And uh, so me and Wayne uh, decided, hey, you want, let's do Moon Knight. Yeah, I think you contacted me about it, and I was like, I think I was like, well, Moon Knight's up. They're not doing anything with that character. Yeah, yeah. so he and it's always been one of my favorite Marvel characters. He got together. He got the rest of the whole team together, yeah. just for all his contacts. And he's like, all right. He goes, because I said, I write when I write. Basically, what I write is more or less an outline or a plot. Right. Very little. There's dialogue in it, but not a lot. Where Wayne, Wayne, Wayne uses a lot of dialogue and a lot of oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, me and him talked about what we wanted to do, uh-huh. how we wanted to do it, what story we was going to do, how he's going to tell it. So I wrote my part. I sent it to Wayne. Wayne punched it up, polished <laughs> it so it looked like an actual goddamn story. <laughs> and gave it to who we had to give it to, and then we started getting the artwork back. And it was yeah, Steve Vasquez it from was bad ass. And Frank Parr did the inks. And it, before we could get it submitted, uh, what well, happened? Like the Superman lawsuit thing happened. Yeah. And uh, they Superman like, lawsuit happened right when Mark Jones got that cover done. Do you remember seeing the cover? Your yeah. airbrushed. And they got- oh, it's so awesome. Now. Now, re- refresh my memory there about that. I did hear about the Superman lawsuit, but uh, I'm trying to remember. What was that about now? Uh, well, one of the independent creators. Oh, do you know, Corey? Do you remember no, all the ahead, details? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. A you're ripper, probably, sorry. You're probably, you're probably more versed in it than I am, though. I can't think of the name of the, the gentleman, but he had sent in a story idea for Superman book, and like a year later... DC put out a very similar titled one shot book and it was his story idea. They wow. gave him no credit wow. for it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So of course he filed a lawsuit against them. But as soon as that happened, Marvel shut down the whole Epic line because the whole idea for Epic was you doing their characters, but you put the team together. 
Oh. The writers, the artists, the inkers, colorists, letters, you put the whole team together and present it to them. Yeah, and then if they oh. approve it, all right, yep. we'll pick you up. You're off and running until we tell you you're, we're done with you. Okay. I was convinced we were in. As soon as I seen everything come in, the art and Mark Jones's cover, I'm like, we got this. We're all going to work for Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, it wasn't to me. <laughs> and then the Superman, the Superman uh, lawsuit happened, and then that was pretty yep. much it. Wow, that's crazy, yeah, but, man. I, I love the way that we wrote together, though. So that's why I said I did. Me too. I, I didn't think it would work when you presented the idea because to me, your writing has always been, you, you do a lot of homage to the silver golden age characters. And I always tried to bring like a cinematic modern feel into the stories. I get a little gritty. I get, I get a little, <laughs> I get like a little seventies death wishes sometimes. Yeah. My characters too. So <laughs> I, I don't, my super, usually most of my superheroes really aren't really superheroes. They're just, uh, Something not right up there. And <laughs> well, I do want to mention this right here. I want to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll dive more into the conversation right here. But first, there's a couple things I do want to mention. Since 1995, HighSpots.com has grown to be the company it is by serving the wrestling fans throughout the world with a great selection of merchandise. HighSpots.com has everything a wrestling fan could want, including the latest WWE and TNA releases, classic wrestling merchandise, and their HighSpots.com exclusive releases. HighSpots.com is the leading online retailer for professional wrestling and mixed martial arts offering autographs, figures, DVDs, apparel, wrestling gear, and even wrestling rings. Their largest clients include WWE, Impact Wrestling, ROH and AEW. Click on the High Spots logo on the Everett Lee Show page over on podcast.net to order. Whether you are a wrestling fan, pro wrestler, or promoter, you can find what you're looking for at highspots.com. If you grew up as a kid in the 1980s or just a fan of 1980s pop culture, then ADTs is for you. ADTs sells a huge variety of licensed t shirts featuring characters, movies, TV shows, video games, and music stars from the 1980s through today. They also have great costumes from 80s pulp culture too. ADTs.com sells officially licensed pulp culture t shirts. As you might guess, their focus is on the 1980s, but do sometimes sell other cool pop culture related tees. 80s Tees has been in business since 2000, meaning they like retro 80s stuff to before it was cool. Follow the link provided in the description section of this episode for more. 80stees.com you're listening to The Everett Lee Show. I don't know which, which if it was Marvel or DC, started showing character flaws and heroes. You know what I'm talking about? I for, yeah, I almost every Marvel character Mar flaw. Yeah, Marvel's credited for bringing that in. Yeah. DC's credited for bringing in that gritty thing with the Watchmen. Yeah, yeah. When they put that book out, that changed comic books forever, man. Batman in the late nine, in the late eighties, uh, early nineties, yep. was getting a little darker. You had the Watchmen. You had V for Vendetta. Uh, yeah, that was another good book. All, all that type of stuff, which I, I was a big fan of that when I was a teenager. Like I said, I grew up on Charles Bronson movies and. Chuck Norris and those type those type of movies I really dug when I was a teenager so when I wrote my comic book characters my comic book characters were very similar to those like uh, I had two main ones we did a book it always had two stories uh, I'm trying it was black market presents that's what it was we were black market presents and uh, I had mr. happy the clown prince of pain which is this homeless guy in clown makeup for some reason, has an unbelievable amount of access to guns. <laughs> <laughs> and, and There's he, the death wish. <laughs> he, he protects, There's the death wish influence. <laughs> he, he protects this little alleyway in Jersey City that they call Cardboard City. 
And then the other story behind it was the antisocial. And the way I always described antisocial was he's the punisher on welfare. He's got <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, his costume's homemade. He's got like he's got like he wears like a purple sweatshirt that's got like have a nice day thing on it, but it's got like a bullet hole in the smiley face thing and uh it's kinda I'm like sure. the watch thing. Uh but it, it says have a nice day and he wears a trench coat. Ooh. And his mask is pretty much he ripped off the bottom of that sweatshirt with that on it, cut eye holes out of it. That's his mask. He owns a gun and ammo store. So that's where he gets his stuff. He goes down every night, he picks some stuff, gets done using it, cleans it up, puts it back on the shelf. So <laughs> that wow. was my story. Yeah. That's 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 <laughs> Wow, All that's that's a lot of influence. Wayne, not as cool as Wayne with his Jonathan Savior. With his dead rocks, you know, you're coming back from the day with a demon. Very on. popular. Yeah, tell, Savior was probably our most popular book. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, I mean, t- tell me about that. Uh, tell me about that character there, and then uh, ap- after that, I want to ask you about writing. Okay. Um, Jonathan Savior, as Ripper was saying, is a uh, he was a rock star, sold his soul to the devil. Why he was in hell? There was two demons that took a liking to torturing him, and uh, those demons, which would become the reverend and father crypt made a deal to come to the real world and get souls for Satan. Innocent souls are more, more powerful in our universe. So they do that. Well, the reverend gets a swollen head and thinks that, Hey, I'm, I can use these souls and become more powerful than Satan and take over. Well, Satan's not going to put up with that. So he tells Johnny, I'll give you your soul back. You go back and stop them. So he sends Jonathan savior back to earth as a zombie. Wow. Flame shooting wow. zombie. <laughs> wow. It's a very much a horror book. Yeah, and decked out in leather, leather jacket. Oh, yeah. Pants. Leather jacket and had the, his uh, bootstraps were chains with the skulls on them. And he's a great looking character. Oh, Barbie's going to hand me the cover to number one if you can see it. Uh, Raise it up. Look. Oh, wow. That nope. is neat, man. I like that. I have the Ash King version of that, and then I have that version signed by Wayne right there. And uh, did Frank do the inks on that? Frank did do the inks on that. Les Garner did the pencils on that, but uh, Brandon Wilt did the cover. Yeah, so Frank did the inks on I got Frank's name on it, too. Wow. That's that's amazing. I like that, man. I like this. I like the concept there. I like the concept, and the, the kind of kind of a little bit reminds me just a, a little bit of like Ghost Rider and Mephisto. I was say it's it's my tribute to Ghost Rider. Yes, it, yeah. I do a lot of that stuff in in my writing and that. I like to pay pay homage to what's come before. Put yeah. my little spin on it, make it different, but. Yeah, it's obvious. You can look at Savior. You know that was my Ghost Rider book. If you picked up Visage, you knew that was my Batman book. Nice. I, um, I love that. Blitz, Blitz was Deadpool before Deadpool become Deadpool, but yeah, Deadpool was out, but Deadpool wasn't doing the whole. He wasn't the talking to the audience and ha- threatening the writer, me Blitz, and Blitz did this. Yeah. From the, get-go. the Blitz yep. did this from the get go, from issue one. He's talking to you. Yep. You the reader. Oh, like, all because okay. of John John Burns She Hawk book. He did a little yeah. section where She Hawk and him would have a little banter back and forth. And I'm like, a little section? Do a whole book like that? That would be awesome. Nobody's doing that. <laughs> that's how Blitz came about. Amazing, man. That's that's amazing. That's cool. That is cool. Yeah, it, yeah. Deadpool always talking, looking at the looking at the looking at the audience and talking with them and stuff. I mean, especially they, yep. they incorporated that into the Deadpool movies, which I thought was great, you know, when he was telling the story. Yep. I I love the Deadpool movies. And I I like I think Ripper was telling me that if you look at Deadpool and then you look at Deathstroke, it's like DC and like version. Yeah, of dead, well, he was yeah. like Rob Leefield, totally and I didn't realize Deadpool. that. Yeah, yeah, he totally created Deadpool to make fun of Deathstroke. <laughs> I, I thought that was. I was like, I really never thought about that. But that's 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 just cool. Oh yeah, they've been ripping off each yeah. other for years. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's why I don't understand why DC why DC wants to be so different in their cinematic universe than Marvel. No, yeah. Marvel laid out a perfect plan. Rip that shit off <laughs> and do it better. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of trying to be different. 
yeah, exactly, exactly. I mentioned I mentioned writing. Sure. Growing up, who, which writers inspired you the most? Which which writer, when you pick up their comic and you read it, you're like, I love this. I love the writing here. Who was who was what in, inspired you? Uh, growing up as a uh, in the superhero writer. field, it's John Byrne, John, John Byrne, Chris Claremont, and John Byrne worked on several different Marvel books. And uh, his writing, it just didn't matter what book he was on; he just made that book great. Oh, so X Men, X -Men run is what? Yeah, well, and then you got Chris Claremont on the X Men run. Man, he was a genius. So, but when it comes to more of the modern stuff, I'm a horror nut, so it was Stephen King. Stephen King oh, flat out wow. was a huge influence. Stephen King, Alice Cooper. Because Alice Cooper would do concept albums to tell the story and everything, and I love that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Cool I, guys influence me. I love I love good concept albums. I, I think I think oh, that yeah. every every artist should do at least one concept album. I think Ripper and I were talking about uh Queen's right. That concept. Yeah, Operation album. Mind Crime. Yeah. Operation Mind Crime. That's the, yeah, the granddaddy of concept albums. Yeah, one of one of my oh, favorites yeah. there. One of my favorites there. Steven and King Diamond. Oh God, King Diamond. King, King Diamond. That's uh, I buy King Diamond albums, whether I like it or not, just to see what the story is. It doesn't matter. I just want to <laughs> check it out because this comes up with some creepy stuff, man. If you get a chance to watch the Puppet Master, that album comes with a DVD. Throw the DVD and turn all the lights off and just prepare to be creeped out. It's it's just it's just um, King Diamond sitting in a room with candles telling the story song by song. Wow, <laughs> yeah, it's very creepy. My my cousin, you gotta see it to believe it. my cousin had a friend growing up, and he would he would come over and stay the night. <clears throat> Excuse me, and. They would watch back in the day, watch Headbangers Ball, and King oh, Diamond, yeah. Diamond would come on. He was scared of King Diamond. He did not like King Diamond. It's, he freaked him out. And it was like, what was it? And he's like, just the look in his voice. He said, they were asleep. They're sitting there. They, they fell asleep one night and had Headbangers Ball on. And all of a sudden, King Diamond song came on, and my cousin woke up, you know, and he was listening to it. And then he looked over at his friend, his friend's sleep, and he said he was like, and covered his feet. <laughs> He's like, change channel, man. Change channel. <laughs> he did not like man, King Diamond. Right. He scared him. <laughs> One of my favorite awesome. King Diamond songs is Abigail. I love that. I love Great that. album. I love the pitch. He uses for that song there. I, I oh, just yeah. love that and the guitar. Yeah, I didn't get into King Diamond. I saw no? King Diamond and I thought he looks like a cross, like a cross between Alice Cooper and Kiss. He looks like he's trying too hard for me. Mm -hmm. you, ah, you should I definitely love, give it a shot. I love Ripper. It. You know I love Alice Cooper. Oh yeah. And who does? Knows I love Kiss. So you think this would be natural? Again, who doesn't? I just, I never, I never got into King Diamond. It, I think one review I read for Abigail when it came out basically said it's a Stephen King story put to music to heavy metal. That's the best way to sum up King Diamond. So you can see what the appeal for me is. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I, I like um, Merciful Fate. I mean, they they had some yep. really good stuff there. Um, I'm thinking about some like old, old uh, metal because I was listening to uh, on liquid liquid metal. I was listening to every once in a while the uh, Bloody Roots where they do history of metal and stuff, and they talk about different genres and stuff. One one episode they did uh, t doing like '84 thrash metal metal a thrash metal from 84 and there's stuff i was listening to i was like man you can tell it's recorded and it's like yeah this is 80 yeah. stuff man this is some 80 stuff there but i like like the like thrash metal there's so many so much thrash metal that's out there like like in the 80s that i think a lot of people should know about and i feel a lot of people have oh, i agree because there's some great underrated bands out there in the thrash metal scene and 
There's and you can probably find them all at Last Man Standing. <laughs> you probably can. Ohio <laughs> stuff you never whiplash. I we're one. I can guarantee you, you won't drive anywhere within a hundred mile radius of us and find a Whiplash album. Those are a great '80s thrash. Yeah, I don't think Gromy. Uh, Gromy? No. Yeah, I said I don't even think Gr- Gromy's a guy in Lima, and I, yeah, I, Gromy's I, awesome. I, I've known him for years. Be a Gromy's, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah. This is a record store, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does, he promotes our store a lot. I, I can't thank him enough. Yeah. But yeah, we've shopped there well since the war wrestling days. I always try to hunt him down in Lima and see where he's at. Yeah, yeah. He still sells tickets for us. Now how yeah. how did you how did you get into getting into owning a record store? How'd that go about? Well, I, I worked for uh, a record st- uh, CD music store called FYE. There used to be thousands of them, you know. Now there's yeah about 400, I think. But uh, I worked there for seven and a half years as assistant manager. And when they announced that our store was closing, everybody was shocked. And um, everybody that worked in the store would get job offers. Hey, you know, when, it, when you're done, hey, call me up, call me up. I never got one job offer. I got are you going to open your own music store now, right? Where are you going to put it at? Everybody was just like coming to me, expecting me to open the music store. And I'm like, well, I, I worked for the corporate music store, but I don't really know much about independent, you know, how to do it independently. And uh, a gentleman uh, that owned Joe's Records, he ended up buying the bins and everything from FYE and was going to open up a store, and he wanted to hire the staff. So... I'm like, this is awesome. Now I can see how the independents do it. So I went to work for Joe's Records for the two and a half years. And then he had problems and had to shut down the store. And then I looked at the wife and said, look, I worked for the, the corporate guys. I've worked for the indie guys. We can do this. Let's just do it ourselves. We'll build it from the ground up. You and, of course, it. extremely you excited. Get it, <laughs> you get it with comics. Why not do it with music? That's, that's what was great. that? I said, you did it with comics. Why not do it with music? Right. That's true. Now, if you come to the store, we got a pretty big comic book section. <laughs> oh, that's that's <laughs> awesome. That's cool awesome. Person. Now, when you walk into your record store, you always get something playing on the... You always get something playing, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. that's Absolutely. I, I love that. I love that. There's a record store here in Daytona Beach. It's been here for about 30 years called Atlantic Sounds. And... They've 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 been open for the last thirty years in Daytona. They've went through everything there for a while. With uh, you know how when like streaming music and stuff, they're like that's gonna kill record stores. It's like well, actually, yeah. there's a lot of people who still buy records, CDs, and cassettes still. You know, and there for a while, I I think it was like about a few years ago, vinyl records started jumping basically, back up, man. Basically. Yeah. Right. A lot of people oh, get yeah. back into collecting the records. Well, same thing, like Wayne can tell you, same thing's happening in comics right now. Yeah. There's a the whole massive layoff happened at DC. Uh, I think I was Image or one of the other ones, and everybody's like worried that everything's going to go to streaming comics. Yeah. Everything's going to be the online comics. They're not going to, you're not going to find any more of the physical, actual comics. And right. I don't think that'll ever happen because no. uh, to, to paraphrase Stan Lee, uh, seeing pictures of boobs is great, but I still rather touch them. Yeah, I'd rather yeah. hold them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that, well, and that, that's, that's like that's, that's like, like books. Asked, yeah, that's what he said whenever they asked him if they thought you know online comics would take over, and, and he always that was his answer to it. And I, I'm like, you know, yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, that's like that's like books, okay? Books. When Kindles, books, download books. Oh no, the books are gonna end. No, people still buy books, man. Yeah, my they wife s- does both. Yeah, my wife does both. Yeah, there's people who still who do both, who do both. Like like my yeah. wife, she she has books. I buy I buy her books. I mean, where I work at, you know, we we sell hardbacks and uh, soft covers pretty reasonable and i've i've bought a few good books i bought her some books just having a physical copy there just reading it i enjoy that i mean she does she does on her phone there she'll scroll up and read read books though but 
it uh, i believe comics it's not going to happen it is not going to happen i know baseball cards all went digital it's like <laughs> Yeah, how do you want a digital baseball card? It, exactly, yeah. Tops. Tops did that. They 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 quit they quit printing. I think it was Tops or uh, one of the, the card baseball ca- card companies. It's all digital. You download them now. It's like how, how do you trade? How do you trade? Do you like trade phones or something? You know, hey, <laughs> King Griffey Junior. I'll trade it for uh, your Jose Canseco. Okay. Here, take my phone. Yes. Hey, hey, come on, man. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it don't make no sense now. It just it it uh, it kills me because comics and books and vinyl records and CDs, even even DVDs and Blu-rays. My my nephew was um, getting on me about buying Blu-rays. Oh, why do why do you have to buy Blu-ray? You could stream it. Yeah, but I want the physical copy of it it's like what if what if uh the streaming services go out at least i have a copy i can throw in my blu-ray player that plays also dvds and he kept bugging me about it one day and i said uh, and i threw this out there at him i said why are you collecting vinyls and i just being i was just being an ass to him i said why are you collecting vinyls you can stream music now man you know that you don't need to buy vinyls just to be an ass to him and he looks at me and he's like <laughs> <laughs> I was just ribbing him about it, you know. But yeah, d- I believe Ripper and Wayne physical copies of stuff is going. It's not going to go away. It's not no, going I, away. I don't see it happening. They've been saying the the death of the CD for. I've been working in the music retail for fifteen years, and they've been saying it from the get go, and they're still here. I don't yeah. know why they both can't exist, anyways. I mean, my wife Barbie, she has stuff on her Kindle, but she'll still buy the books in that too. I mean, is there something about having, you can get um, exposure from the digital stuff, but you still want to own it. And if you're streaming the movies, they don't always keep those movies up. I mean, Netflix doesn't have those movies all the time. So when you own the copy, the physical copy, you can watch it anytime you want. You're not at the mercy of the streaming service. Exactly. It makes more sense to me. And, and it has some value. There's no value in your streaming service. Right. People who bought the uh, vinyl when it was first starting to be repressed in that, uh, like tools vinyl, if you go look up the early stuff that's out of print and it doesn't take long anymore for things to go out of print, they're two, three, four hundred dollars for used copies online. You, how is that working for your MP3 player? What, what's the value in that? You spent the money and you got nothing to show for it. Exactly. I think people are coming around to that, starting to realize computer crash. You lost everything. Well, that's terrible. Just re-rip it, though. Oh, I can't. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's so much better to have a physical copy of something. It's just too too many. Like a while back ago, my cable and internet went out. I I moved one thing, and. I moved. I moved my hub to across the room when I rearranged my living room. So we had no internet and cable. We called called them, and my wife spoke with them, and they said we won't be out till tomorrow. It's like, all right, no, no cable, no internet for tonight. So what do we do? I look over. I'm like, I got a Blu-ray DVD player, and I got all these movies. So let's see what I haven't watched in a while. I went through and I, I like that night. I had movie night there, popping in in and out DVDs. Man, oh, it was great. I loved it. I loved it. Now, I sat there. Right now, now, since since you opened a music store, uh, how much do you keep up with what's going on in comics? In comics, not a whole lot. Every now and then, I will pop on and just check out stuff, just out of curiosity. But a lot of the newer stuff just doesn't. The, the the more the modern comics, whether it's DC or Marvel, or in, they just don't have the same feel that they used to have. They don't seem to be. There's no nobody's doing anything that grabs me. Yeah. I mean, I got back into comic books because Todd McFarlane was drawing Spawn, and I kept walking by the spinner rack at the local Bookland, and I would I see the Spider-Man book, and I'd look at my friend, I'd be like, Wow, that that dude's style, that whoever's drawing that style is really unique. And I started picking it up, and I'm like, you know, he could almost get me back into comics again. And then the next thing you know, I'm buying comics again. Nice. What about what about Batman? Uh, Ripper, you heard about the, I believe it was the 
Batman who laughs last. The, no, the Batman who laughs. Yeah. 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 They got, it's uh, it's another you know he's from another dimension or something. I don't know. I ain't followed so much of this stuff anymore because they put so much of it out. Especially DC. As soon as you start getting into something, they've rebooted the DC universe like three times here within the last five years. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's like... I just see a little bit of that New 52. They needed to reboot it again. That was terrible. Yeah, they did the New 52. They did... Uh, and then after that, what was after that? There was something after that. And then they were talking about doing it again. Yeah. <sighs> DC 5G or whatever, but I don't know if they're going to do that now after the big shakeup because that Dan this was after uh, AT and T had bought uh, Time Warner, so yeah. now you know they've got their fingers into stuff about trying to do things that they know nothing about. Right. Uh, you know because that, that's what killed WCW was company mergers. Yeah. And, and they was like, oh well, wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> You're an idiot. You didn't. Know, you didn't know how to do. It wasn't your world. You should have got somebody that that was their world. Have them do it. It probably would have been profitable. That's yeah. what they're afraid is going to happen here with DC. They're thinking the rumor mill is if they don't start turning a profit, that they're going to sell that off. Yeah. Right. I read something that DC's not even um, being carried by the by like Diamond anymore. They were doing yeah, their own distribution for two places. That was DC's decision. DC, yeah, yeah, they don't, they, they didn't want to be distributed by Diamond anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no love for Diamond, so Ripper. David C. Russell jumped on. He said, "Hello, guys," and he said, "I was talking WCW 15 minutes ago." LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to David C. Russell there. Now. Talking like talking about independent publishing and being a publisher. Ripper told me about independent comics, which he I never thought about this way. When you go to a convention, he pulled up a good point. He said, when you go to these conventions, like these big conventions, he said, always look for the independent comic publishers because they put out the best stuff and they put out stuff that you normally wouldn't see from like big companies and stuff being being an independent publisher and going to conventions and starting up your own uh, companies there how how did that really start for you and what how did it lead into where you're at now for me Oh, definitely. Um, oh, okay. Um, I I seen an ad at uh, one of the comic book stores in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I was living at, and um, it was a guy who was looking for writers and pencilers and that to do his own thing. Um, so I hooked up with him, but that didn't exactly go anywhere. Um, at one of the little cons at a mall, uh, one of the dealers was telling me about this. Indiana group called Hall of Heroes that was starting up and they were looking for people to publish. I got some so I hit their booth and got their information and then I took and made another sign and stuck it in the two comic book stores looking for people to put creative teams together and to publish through Hall of Heroes. That's how I got started. Um, that didn't go anywhere because the Hall of Hero books were terrible. Yeah. So, But at that yeah. time, I had Illusion Studios going we probably had about 30 members then that were working on about 23 different books. And another guy met us at a show and we took off right away. We got invited to one of the local shows. I paid $20 for the table and we put half the crew was coming in the morning to a certain time. And then the other half of the people would come in and, and then those people could go enjoy the show, you know, who were there first, the first crew. But we got sent, all I did was photocopy our characters that we were working on at the time and gave them a, away to people as they walked in to the show and we were the first table well after about an hour or so the promoter come up and asked me how do you feel if they gave us another table on the hallway because nobody can get in we had such a backup line there of people wanting to know who these characters were wow and so he gave us that table and then we had them blocked in the hallway and blocked at the beginning of the show you still couldn't get into the show <laughs> and uh there 
was going to start up his own publishing, and he asked if Hollow Heroes had all of our characters exclusively, and I was like, no. We're only doing three books that I know. And he was like, well, I would be interested in putting out the rest. And then, so we went with him, but he didn't get anything off the ground. Hall of Heroes was still going, and I'm just like, I don't want to go back there. Let's just do it ourselves. And we just slowly started piecing it. We, we got books on it. Um, we started meeting more people. I formed, a, oh, what do you call it? I loved everything to be a democracy back then. I loved everybody to have a say. I wanted to make a studio. So it was called Illusion Studios. I wanted everybody to vote on where we were going and what we were going to do. That doesn't work, though, because the people who don't get their way, they get mad. But I formed a committee and everything and tried to do it that way, and that fell apart. And I just put it back together again. And that fell. I put Illusion Studios together four times before we got to... Um, where we could produce stuff on a regular basis to where Corey saw us. Right, right. And uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> now, going through the tears. Yeah, now, Elusive How did we get to where I am now? Okay. Yeah. Um, we were doing local shows in and getting invited to come do the shows. We were getting really popular. Our characters with ash cans that Ripper had said he saw that he got, we were selling a lot of those. So, the next stage is to do the actual comic books. We were looking for printers. We started doing bigger shows and ran into Kim Preeny from Preeny Printing and Litho in Windsor, Ontario. And he was like, well, Brenner was the big printer at the time in Texas, but we can, we're closer to you. You can actually drive where you live. You can drive right across the border and get your books and we're cheaper. We'll do a nice. better job. So we, we, me and Barbie, um, and we all met with them, drove up there, met the place, got a tour of the printing facility, and just started printing our own books from there. Like I said, with Legacy then, the next step was Legacy to help other publishers um, stay in business. And then when the whole market basically collapsed, late 90s, early 2000s, um, everything just went bust. I mean... Ripper was there. He's seen what happened to comic books. They just you, you had the uh, distribution wars going on where Marvel bought the Hawaiian distributor, and then DC got Image and DC or uh, Diamond got Image and DC exclusives, and it was terrible. So when that bottom fell out, me and Frank decided, Frank Park, let's just do something together. Let's form a new studio and do something together. And we tried various different things. And then finally, he was flipping through a notebook talking about these kaiju he created. And I'm like, nobody's doing this. No. And that, that's bait for me. Anybody's not doing it, I could be the first to do it. I definitely, I'm in. Yeah. Let's give this a shot. Yeah. And Frank didn't want to draw comic books at the time. Uh -huh. So suggested doing illustrated novels. I'll write the story. So that's the bulk. And all you got to do is draw pictures to go with it. Right. And we did that for a few years, but when we went to G-Fest, it was unlike anything I've seen in comic books. The G-Fest people ate it up. The fans were great. So we're like, hey, maybe we can give this Dragonfire Studios another shot. And then, a friend, of course, Frank changes his mind and wants to do comic books again. <laughs> so I'm like, these two books that we've written are too big for comic books, so what are we going to do? Well, let's do graphic novels then. I mean, they're all over 100-page books. So I like, look, all I got to do is write it and help with the lettering. You got to, Frank's got a pencil, ink it, and color it. Because we've now switched to color, of course. Yeah. So he's got a lot of work to do, but he was all gung-ho about doing it. Barbie was on hand. She's always, she's the third wheel. She always tries to keep us in check. Me and Frank are like brothers. We fight and argue now like nothing about everything. It's it's family, you know? Yeah. And Barbie just kind of slaps us around, keeps us in line, and gets us trying to get focused, get this project done, you know, keep moving. You're, you're wasting too much time. That's, that's where we're at now. We just do it now when we can do it. It takes a lot longer to do the 120 page books. Yeah. Um, yeah. that it did the comic books. I mean, I could whip out a comic back in the nineties. I was whipping out comic book scripts. Blitz took me an hour and a half to write that first script. Wow. That was it. Yeah. I wrote, I wrote the entire, which all of it didn't get published. But I wrote the entire Mr. Story, Mr. Happy Story and Antisocial. Why does that work? I, I yeah. Whenever the line would stop, I, I, I was back in uh, what's called tire docks back there. I just put tires on a conveyor, 
going down line. If it stopped, I pick up the tablet, start writing, line start moving, put the tablet down. Yeah, and I'm, I think maybe a month total, I had it all completely done. Damn. Oh, uh, uh, pencil, pen, and paper. No, no, the writing. You say tablet. The writing part. The reason it never got done is because wasn't me. I had my part done, but you know. <laughs> Well, all my early scripts were handwritten, all and my, then I would type them out on a computer. I yeah. don't type my all my stuff's handwritten. My, me and my son's working together on one now, and which you know he's had to stop. He's back. College started back up, but, but we're doing it pretty much like how me and you did it, Wayne. Oh yeah. He writes more like you. Matter of fact, I just read yeah. they had he had a, he had to write a uh, novella for one of his classes, and they published they put together published like one for all the students of this, what they wrote. And he just got his back this week and he brought it over here. His mom read it and then I read it. And, uh, boy, he, he's so much better than me. But don't tell him my son. <laughs> don't tell him my son. <laughs> but he, it, the stuff that he was writing was great. And that's how it was with this. I said, here's my idea. I gave, I just, you know how I write. I had the whole plot. You yeah. know, there's some dialogue in it. And then Logan just punched it up. And he's yeah. writing, he's, he's adding this stuff, and he's putting this stuff in. He's like, well, if we connect this with this and this, so we'll do it. And he's even breaking it down how he wants it drawn out. You know, this is the scene. I'm like, have at it, boy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Now, Wayne, what advice would you give to someone starting up and trying to get into being an independent comic, uh, comic, comic writer, artist, or uh, just trying to get into it? What advice would you give to someone? Basically, get into it. Just start doing it. Start doing it. Go in the shows, even if they're just little local shows. Go there. Talk to people. Don't sit there. Don't just set. I, I go through Artist Alley so many times, and the creators are sitting there with their heads down, and not talking to anybody going by. You gotta, gotta talk to people. You yeah. gotta engage them. That never happened. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. People go out yeah. I mean, that's walk by. I'd be like, hey, hey, come here. And, come here. Like, you got a hockey jersey on. You like violence? Come here. You're like my comic. <laughs> I love, I love, you're wearing I love, a slayer nobody. shirt pick it up jonathan Savior. you're gonna love this yeah nobody, <laughs> nobody just walked past my booth when i was at a con i made damn sure of that you're not just walking by my booth you're gonna come check this out you're gonna ask me a question about it i'm gonna have the answer you're gonna want to buy it and, and if you can't do that personality wise find somebody who can I'm somebody who's friendly and likes to talk to people. I love to talk to people. Yeah, I, 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 I noticed like that. What, people I, like would request to be near our booths. Like in what was that? Uh, people, I know there was people that requested to be like in the same area as us. Yeah. <laughs> we, we just kind of showed up at the con and took over the areas and that. Yeah, especially Pittsburgh. <laughs> the kings of Pittsburgh, baby. Oh, I know. At one time, we had a nine-table island in Pittsburgh when Legacy was really rolling. Yeah. It was good. It was fun. That's and we got a lot of um, um, popularity from those panel discussions. I mean, it started out an hour panel discussion, but I can talk for an hour about nothing. That's easy. Next thing you know, they're like, well, we're going to give you two hours. Yeah, That's you great. And we started out in one ballroom. Two hours. I can do two hours. That's no problem. And the next thing you know, they're coming in telling us, hey, we got to let the next people have their panel. So you got to wrap it up. You know a guy like that, don't you ever? <laughs> What's that? You know a guy like that, don't you ever? What's that? <laughs> Did you know a guy like that that can just talk and talk and talk? And yeah, you. <laughs> you. <laughs> you. And that's why I like you. That's why I got you as my co-host on ELS Uncut, because you can talk about, you're like an encyclopedia of talking about different things. That's that's what I love about you. That's, I mentioned my friend Bob, and he likes to say, I know just enough about everything to get me in trouble. <laughs> wow yeah i i know what you i know what you mean wayne because at the daytona beach comic book convention when we we'd have that 
we'd it'd be at the uh, at the college over here at, at Emory Riddle College. It's a uh, flight college. Well, they got a gymnasium where they hold the comic book convention. I'd go in there, and they'd have some great guests to show up. They one year they had the car from Supernatural out front. You could sit out there and take oh, yeah. pictures with it, which I thought was amazing. Inside, they had guests. They had a lot of guest um, like panels, like from different uh, like comic comic uh, publishers, independent publishers, and they would have stuff from even like. Uh, you know, guests they they got like started getting like legends in their wrestlers. I met Rocky Johnson there. Um, pretended I didn't know who his son was The Rock, and he thought I was serious. And he looked over at his wife and he's like, "Is this guy serious?" It's <laughs> like I'm just kidding, man. Because uh, he showed me a picture. He says, "He said, see, that's my son right there. That's my son." I said, "Oh, you're the you're you're The Rock's dad." And he's like, yeah, I'm the rock dad. I was like, no way. And he's like, is this guy serious? Or what? <laughs> I'm, just so loud. I'm like, I'm kidding. But I would notice at certain tables walking around, people just sitting there with their heads down. Some people coming up, interacting and talking and stuff. But a lot of them, I notice, just their heads down. And someone come up and they're like, you know, they, they'd greet someone, come up to your table. Hey, how you doing? And explain what they got there. And and then the person be like, all right. And then just turn and walk off. And yeah, it's like, so shit doing that. <laughs> so shit doing that. I got, I, I, bet I went last two years I went to the Cincinnati Comic Expo and I go to the independent guy thing I went to uh, Wizard World Columbus a couple times uh, when Logan was little I took him but I'll go up there and I'll be like tell me what you got I'm like Ex explain tell me your give me your sales pitch you know and some of them they have a pitch and they're all about it and then other people was like man what it, it's I, I since I've been in wrestling, I relate a lot of stuff to wrestling. Yeah, you know, uh, you gotta make me give a shit. Like if I'm watching a wrestling match, I don't give a shit that you know how to do all these moves because this guy knows how to do all them same moves. Give me a reason to give a shit that you know all these moves. You can draw a big muscle dude. That guy down there can draw a big muscle dude. Give me a reason to give a shit. Make me want to spend my money on what you created. Yeah. Yeah. I, give a mm -hmm. shit about what you were putting out there. I'm not. I mean, go back and you, you look at my stuff and read it. I go back and read. It, I'm like, I don't know how I sold any of it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> as far as story, now, see, I'm the opposite. I go back, read my scripts, the original scripts or the books, and I go, this stuff's amazing. Why didn't we get farther than we did? Yeah, but I'm like, boy, this is pretty simplistic, uh, and. But, you know, there would be people that would eat it up. Yeah. And I think that's more to do with how we presented ourselves when we were at cons. It's just oh, to yeah. People to buy it. It's like and, they've seen that, you know, we're really passionate about what we're putting out there. Right. You know? Absolutely. We have, right. we have this. I created this for you to enjoy. I think the now, one thing that we did with Illusion Studios – a little better than most of the independents is that we our books we had 12 different titles that we narrowed it down to but it didn't matter what you come to our table and liked we had a title that would fall into that category right so usually people would walk away with buying something or being excited about something cuz we could relate to them yeah that I, I think i think that's that's what's good is if you can put a comic out there and with that comic and that story and how it looks and everything and if that person picks it up and looks at it and reads it and gets drawn into it then that way the, that you're you're connecting with that fan there with what you've created there and that's that's great because then at conventions when you're there it's like you get to hear stories and just talk and interact with the fans that enjoy the work that you do i that's how, i think it's amazing i, I really feel do. i feel like the same way with music too especially if you're doing original stuff that's something you created. It's something you pulled your heart out and put into. So when you're performing, are you just going to be up there and be like, 
and then say it's yeah. <laughs> boring <laughs> audience. Yeah. <laughs> you got to call the audience in. So they, yeah, let's all kick ass. Yeah, I want to go fuck this shit up. <laughs> <laughs> grab, grab the guitar and slam it down like Pete Townsend. Thank yeah, you and good night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's worth doing. It's worth overdoing. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah. if, you, I mean, if you create any kind of content, yeah, you have to be excited about it because if you're not excited about it, then why the hell would anybody else be? Exactly. That's true. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It's it's like what what I do day in day in or once once a week or just day in day out just thinking about what what to do, what guests I'm going to have on, and just the content that I put out for people that that listen listen or, or watch what I do, and then just the people involved like like Ripper and just add that other element and just. Putting the, being a content creator, I love it. I love it because it's it's good because you're passionate about what you do. That's why I like independent film. I I I love the independent film like directors and the the, the actors and actresses I talk to because they 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 love you know talking about that project or that film that they're doing and that's what i love talking about them because it's just the passion behind it and i i love that it's raw passion you know it's just like like i i got excited because ripper like i said earlier ripper made me think about when you go to conventions and stuff don't go for the big stuff check out the check out the independent publishers you might find something that yeah, you never you, knew yeah. existed. And yeah. I'm like, I never really Marvel. thought about that, honestly. <laughs> you can get Marvel and DC Comics goddamn anywhere. You can go yeah. Golden Book and get Marvel and DC Comics. You can go to uh, Books a Million, any of them places. You can go to Walmart, they have DC Comics and Marvel Comics. What they don't have is a guy who's busting his ass, a guy who poured his heart into this and said, you know, I think this is so good. I want to share it with the world. Yeah. Which, that's what drew me to a guy like Wayne. Showed me that you know what? It's not. It, it doesn't have to be hard. To be hard. It can be simple. Look what they did. Look what they're putting out there. I can do this, and I'm so glad I did because. Those are some of the funnest times in my entire life working them cons. Oh with, man, with studio! I can write, I can write books on stuff that happened at those cons. <laughs> Work, working, working with, you know, I still talk to Mikey Woods every once in a while on Facebook, uh, and Jason Bender that we met in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, Marcel is that I just I was going through comics the other day and I found the thank you card that had his. Uh, what was the name of that comic he had uh, with the two guys, with the like the old gangster type guys? But it was uh, had had them on there, and he's like, it was a little thank you for hanging out, and like the cons wouldn't be the same without you. So I like I took I'm like, yeah, look at this, and Marcel was like, holy shit, <laughs> <That happened. laughs> it was so much fun for for me. That's more of a compliment when somebody like Ripper tells me, you know, you influenced me to do this. And those panel discussions we did, every now and then I would get an email or I'll get a message on Facebook from somebody. Uh, the last one I got was from somebody down in South America who was up at the Pittsburgh show, saw our panel discussion, and we had put out on disc everything that we covered at the show on the CD-ROM, and every known distributor we had, uh, the Zurich Foundation, where you can get grants and everything to help you publish. We put all that information on the disc, sold it for 10 bucks. He took that, and when he went back home, he now teaches off that disc, he teaches kids how to do comic books. Wow, and every that's now and amazing. I, will get, I will get somebody contact me and say, you influenced me. You know, I was so inspired by you. And that, that to me is awesome. That's worth more than any um, publicity I could get or, you know, any kind of money I could get from doing this stuff. Pretty pretty good for a bunch of guys sitting around in the booth saying, oh, man, let's throw in the towel. This is terrible. We're not doing good at all. What's happening to us? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I'm surprised my TV would even allow that to happen, but it did. Well, that's... I can be honest, there was a lot of sad times. I mean, when things started falling apart, that was sad. And I had a lot of personal stuff happen to me. So I'm trying to keep Illusion Studios going and Legacy going at the same time. And then I had all these personal problems, and it was just, it was too much. Yeah. Everything just kind of collapsed on me. But I'm a stubborn bastard, so I just get right back up and start swinging again. There you go, man. You got to. Well, you got to. You got to well, get up. Yeah. When when the chips are down, yeah. get yourself back up and keep going because that's that's all Absolutely. that's all we can do. That's all we can do. I mean, you got to. Well, nobody, nobody who ever made it in any medium has ever had a great time doing it. They all had trials and really bad stuff that happened to them. I watch music documentaries. I watch documentaries on actors. Every one of them had terrible stuff happen on the way to the top. Yeah. So they can overcome all that. Why can't we all do it? Exactly. They're just people. They have mom and dad just like us. They have families. They have problems. They have good times, bad times. Use all that. I, I did in the story, if you read the Visage books, it's very controversial subject matters, and a lot of that stuff I had to go through. So I just put it into my stories. Yeah. Hopefully I can help somebody else. There was a, a, um, a child abuse organization where guys and girls and gals, you know, have been um, gone through the court system for abuse, and I did a child abuse issue of Visage that we would give away. And uh, they asked if they could buy a bunch of those from me, and they used it in the classes to reach the abusers. And they said they had a great response from it, people not realizing what they did to their kids. And they could see in the story what happened, and a lot of that stuff happened to me from my stepdad. But I thought that was awesome that they got um, to help other people. And you threw something. Bring all that back. I want it all back. <laughs> I want it all back. <laughs> Ripper wants it all back. He wants it all back. That I I love that. I love that. I'm Wayne. just gonna start writing shit and sending it to Wayne to the point. Where <laughs> God damn it! I, you know, I could use the co-writer because I am so slow nowadays. Frank has to do all that work, and I can't keep up with him. He can put the pencils, the inks, and the colors down before I can get him get a script done. Oh, it took me. He's like a madman. Oh it took man! Me to write what I gave Logan to write. I'm, I'm like, oh man, I got, right I got like this that. job, I got the score, I got to get this done, I got to get that script finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, i i've I've had I've had a lot of fun and talking talking with you, and just okay. we we talked about a lot of things, man. I I loved it uh, yeah. talking about Dragonfly Studio image and just just I mean. A lot, a lot of good conversation, man. I, I kind of figured, I've kind of figured this is kind of how the, how the, how the conversation would go and stuff. And uh, I mean, it started out great, you know, Ripper. <laughs> I said, Wayne, I seen the picture of when I, the uh, when the first weekend your store was open and I came up, and there's a picture. Of oh yeah, that little hole where we had the little hole there. Yeah, and the both of us throwing up the devil horns, and I was like. <laughs> I was like basically me and wayne whenever we're together yeah i i love that this, yeah he said that to me how much explains me and wayne together <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it so what uh what do you what do you got what do you got in the works what do you got coming up wayne what do you have we're wrapping on? up the second part of the iraqis first atomic rex um crossover called uh, avatars of the apocalypse we're doing the second part of that right now all the art's done the pages just need to be the lettering needs to be put on all the pages all the worm balloons need to be it's all my job <laughs> so after that <laughs> i'm slowing everything down as usual now um after that we're going to work on which would be the kaiju book four um that's our cronk Verse Iraqis book, and that's our tribute to King Kong vs. Godzilla, because they've done a new King Kong vs. Godzilla movie. Yeah. So we originally had planned a, this was a few years ago, to do an unofficial sequel to King Kong vs. Godzilla. And I started writing the script, well, then we moved on to other things and started working on our own stuff. So I'm going to adapt that script to our next book. That's what we got planned. Oh, nice. 
Nice. That's that's amazing, man. And where where can people find on social media more about Dragonfly Studio and what you do? Dragonfly. You go to Dragonfire Studios Facebook page and look us up there and you can find us there. You can just message us directly. Okay. Nice. Tons of cool art on there. Tons of cool art. Yeah, I was I was looking. Thank thanks, uh, Ripper. Ripper sent me the uh, invite, and I I love that. I I love the artwork, and I love the stuff that I see on there. I'm definitely gonna have to go back and check out more. I definitely love it, man. It's definitely different than doing the comic book stuff. Yeah. With the kaiju verse stuff, I gotta. It's just not as easy i gotta put a lot of work into it a lot of effort that's, that's why you're a better writer than me because i don't think I yeah can. <laughs> hopefully it shows in the stories because if you pick up that um Iraqis first atomic rex part one it's insane the amount of plots that i've thrown in there and, and ripper was talking about how he did the plots and everything i'm not really that kind of a writer frank will come up with some basic plots and then what i like to do is start taking that little basic thing, start writing the story. And basically while you're flipping through the pages, reading it for the first time, that's how I was writing it. I don't always know where my stories are going or what the characters are going to do. I just watch the story on my head and type it down and enjoy it. Just like everybody else says, maybe that's why I enjoy my scripts more Ripper. (laughs) I can go back and read that old stuff. And I'm like, wow, how did I come up with this? I couldn't come up with this now. (laughs) Alcohol, Alcohol was probably involved. (laughs) <laughs> I'll, yeah, <laughs> was a bug, was a bug at uh, the Motor City Con. That's that's probably what happened. <laughs> <laughs> wow, but I I do want to I do want to thank you and I do appreciate you uh, taking time out tonight and coming on here and talking with uh, myself and uh, Ripper about about comics and everything else in between music and it's been great, man. It's been great. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is the first time I've ever done a podcast. So yeah, now that you've done it, we can get you back on. Yeah, At anytime. Yeah, anytime you guys want. I mean, I'm pre- basically know a little bit about everything too. You know, just enough to get me in trouble, and <laughs> I do like to get in trouble. So, but you see my Facebook post, so I don't mind getting in trouble at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, do appreciate it, man. Um, want to wish you a good night, and and yeah, we'll definitely have to. Uh, Definitely have to get you back on again. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Podcasting Network, your top source for independent podcasting. Head over to podcasting.net. Follow them on social media, Podcasting Network on Facebook, Twitter at Podcasting Net. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, Podcasting Network, and on Twitch, backslash Podcast City Network. Podcasting Network. Be creative, be independent. Be yourself. When I need a logo or graphic design done, I use Three Count Design. Three Count Design offers a wide range of graphic design products, video, photography, and other forms of media. Everything from t-shirt designs to websites. For more information, head over to Facebook.com slash Three Count Design. That is Facebook.com slash Three Count Design. When I want to kick back a few cold ones with my friends, I head over to City Limits Taproom. City Limits Tap Room has a wide selection of TVs to watch your favorite sports, indoor and outdoor seating. They are pet friendly. City Limits Tap Room also has food made fresh to order, and the grilled cheese is excellent. I recommend the grilled cheese and the apple pie cider. The fries on the side, can't go wrong with that, baby. For more information for upcoming events, head over to facebook.com slash city limits tap room. Thank you, Wayne Smith. As mentioned in the segment where you can follow and keep up with more of Wayne Smith's work and everything else that was mentioned. Love talking with that guy. Love to get him back on in the future here on the Everett Lee Show. But other than that, be sure to head over to podcastingnetwork.net slash shop for the latest apparel. We have a lot of apparel. We just opened our shop up. I'm excited. We have Podcast City merchandise that you can get 
to show your support for Podcasting Network. And final score is on Podcasting Network's shop section there on podcasting.net. Be sure to pick up some final score merchandise and show your support for Podcasting Network's number one sports programming. Uh, and with all your needs with sports, final score, why listen to anything else? Here soon, we'll be adding more merchandise from shows that's featured on Podcast City Network. You may see some Every Lee Show merchandise pop up on there as well. And that's it for this episode of the Every Lee Show. Signing off. Everyone have a good week, weekend. I'll see you again next time for another episode of the Everett Lee Show. 